Okay, welcome back. We're ready to launch in to studying about research with texts. There are lots of different ways you can do research on texts and we'll explore a bunch of them. Right now, you've just started working with your groups, so I want you to take a minute to think about what sort of texts, what sort of information that's contained in textual forms you might want to use in order to do your research project. So have a think about that and then we'll talk about some of the challenges and exciting parts of text-based research. So a lot of you might be thinking, of course I know how to use text for research. That's like every term paper I've written so far since I've come to university. No, it is not. You only think it is. So when we talk about text-based research, what we mean is using text as primary information sources, right? So hopefully you all are solid on the distinction between a primary and a secondary source. A primary source is something that gives you kind of direct data. A secondary source is something that has had analysis added in. So those articles that you read for your paper at the beginning of this class, for instance, those are secondary sources, right? What we're talking about in this unit is about how to use text and how to analyze text as a type of primary source. And there are a couple of different things that you can use texts for in different concepts. First thing is you can use a text to help you figure out what happened. Why would you need a text to figure out what happened? Well, sometimes it happened a while ago. Sometimes it happened somewhere you weren't, right? And so in those cases, you need to figure out and construct a narrative of what occurred at a certain instance without actually having to have been there and seen it with your own eyes, right? Um, so my first job out of university was working as a research assistant for a professor. And she had a big hypothesis to test about the relationship between social movement activity and various forms of political reform in the Middle East. And so she said, Emily, this is what I want you to do. I want you to sit down, I want you to use this news database, and I want you to search the following keywords in the following order with this country name between these dates. And then every time there's one of those that when you read it represents some kind of contention, some case where people were protesting or using violence against the state or starting a petition or any kind of resistance against the state, I want you to record the following information about it. So in that case, I was using those texts to just get information straight up about what happened. You can do this sort of research with databases that are online, or you can do this sort of research with specialized archives. Something that a lot of graduate students do is they work with the Hansard of Parliament, right? which is the recording of everything that happens in Parliament, and they analyze that to get their information. right? And other legislatures around the world have similar books, even though they're called different things. Right? So in some case, you follow and you read these texts to figure out what happened. Sometimes this is just what you need a text to do. Sometimes you need to figure out what happened and then you're going to collect other data some other way on some other thing. That's fine. Oftentimes we turn to these primary texts just to get a narrative of what happened. It's worth saying, however, that you do not have the pure and objective truth of what happened. Why not? Because somebody put those words together. That text is made in a particular context. Right? So for instance, one of the most powerful uses of archival texts I've seen lately has been a set of um, advertisements for escaped slaves from the southern U.S. that puts out information about these slaves with the express purpose of them being captured and returned as lost property to their owners. However, because we have so little data on what the lives of enslaved people were, we actually have all sorts of information about what their skills were, what their families were like, but only from the perspective of their owners, right? So you would never think that the owner of a slave knows better than the slave themselves what they're like, but sometimes that's the data you can collect, so that's what you work with. So you can use text to figure out what people, what happened. But the next thing you can use is to get text to figure out what people think. So for instance, think about those examples of uh, runaway slave advertisements, right? One of the things you could learn from them is what kind of information that slave owners thought was important about their slaves, right? What sort of words did they use to describe them? What sort of tasks were they described as being capable of doing, right? 
And so this allowed us to learn new things about how slave owners thought about slaves. You can read um, people's diaries. You can read personal accounts. You can read journalistic accounts. You can read the analysis that people made. And often what you're trying to get out of it is how did people think about this particular problem? This matters a lot if people are distant from you in time or if people are distant from you in space or in all sorts of different ways. And so when you're reading a text, you're trying to figure out how the people who were involved at that interaction, what they were thinking and how they were framing it, right? And you can both learn a lot about what the writer thinks and if the writer is quoting other people or describing the activities of other people, you can learn about them too. So there's a lot of information about how people think that can be contained in a text. The third thing you can learn is how something is talked about. Now this might seem similar to what people think, but in fact it's slightly different because think about the fact that um, we betray a lot of what we wouldn't say out loud, but that we actually do think and mean in what we write, right? So if you think about those uh, runaway slave advertisements, right, it would show that um, one of the things that's most important to slave owners is the labor their slaves do, right? And so they're described in terms of their laboring skills, and so that's the most important thing. Or for instance, you see a lot of references to female slaves as being of childbearing years or as you know, being a good breeder, right? Which demonstrates that what slave owners cared about was the ability of their female slaves to produce new slaves for them, right? And so what you learn is this is part of how slave owners thought about their human property, right? You don't learn as much about what the human property thought about the slave owners. We can make some assumptions and certainly we have texts by former slaves that help us understand that process, but we, can't, we don't have that information from this. We have other information about what slaves thought from accounts of slave rebellions, right? And where you have accounts of slave rebellions, you have accounts of the arguments the slaves made, but you also have the impression of what the slave owners and the white society thought about slave rebellions, right? And how they talked about it and what frames they used to talk about. So one of the things that's really important to think about is that there are two types of information you can get from a text. It's manifest content and it's latent content, right? It's manifest content is what it says. When I was going through and coding all those news articles for examples of contestation events in countries all over the Middle East when I was, you know, just grad of school, then what happened is that I was coding only for manifest content. Did the PKK carry out a military attack at this point in time? Was there a protest that happened on this day? Who was at the protest, right? I was just carrying out that kind of analysis. Latent analysis is what you would be doing if you were looking for deeper ideas of meaning or analysis that are embedded in it looking for things that aren't said, looking for ideas and concepts that are hinted out, or the ways in which people gesture towards a bigger idea without ever coming out and saying it. We leave all sorts of information like that in texts all the time. And so latent analysis allows us to get new information out of a text, even if its manifest content is not actually that interesting to us. So these are some of the ways that you can use a text and all of them provide you with a tremendous amount of information that can really push your project forward. So there are lots of different approaches that you can take when you want to work with text. In particular, there are two really important different ideas, um, and really they fall into different classes of textual analysis. Those are discourse analysis and content analysis. And while they have a lot of things in common, it's worth knowing for yourself whether you're going to be following a discourse analytic or a contact, content analytic process during your work because it has a lot of implications, right? So discourse analysis is the study of how discourses, meaning ways of talking about things, provide meaning and interface with power. It's about looking in a big context, whereas content analysis is really about drilling down into what precisely a text says with less context. 
fair costs and benefits to each approach, and really which one you follow depends on what you want to learn from what you're doing, right? So let's start with content analysis because I think for a lot of people it's a little more direct and easy to understand. Um, essentially content analysis is just the systematic analysis of textual information. You have a bunch of text, you want to go through it, and you want to figure out what's in it, right? So to a certain extent, the sort of coding work I described working on where I was coding incidents of um, protest was a sort of content analysis, right? I was reading newspaper articles and I was marking down some things about how they talked about the world. So you can use either a qualitative method or a quantitative method to do content analysis. Computers are pretty good at counting things and they're pretty good at being handed a bunch of text and going through and saying, okay, you have this word so many times, you have this phrase so many times, right? Machine learning algorithms are great at that. There are limits to what they can do. You can also have a computer help you do textual analysis by going down and marking here is a theme, here is a theme, here is a theme, and doing that sort of analysis. Now, just because content analysis is about systematically looking at textual information does not mean you're only looking at the manifest content in it. In fact, it means you can look at the latent content. You can look at what's missing, what's not mentioned, what's mentioned together, how things interact with each other, right? But the real thing you're doing when you're talking about content analysis is you're looking just at the text and you're not allowing in too much of the external context. Discourse analysis, on the other hand, is entirely about the context. Um, one way that I've heard people talk about discourse analysis is it's about language beyond the sentence. What is said, what is not said, and how it is said in conversation with the surrounding social and historical context, right? And some of the most important schools of discourse analysis really center an analysis of power. Without getting into the difference between critical discourse analysis and post-structuralist approaches to talking about language and politics, what is important is to say that when you're doing a discourse analysis, frequently you want to make assumptions, or not assumptions, apologies. You want to make an analysis of how power is working. What are the things that people don't feel able to say that they have to use euphemisms for? What are the necessary sort of responses that people have to questions? So for instance, um, I remember reading a whole set of US government um, committee hearing reports once, and I was looking for information about how they talked, doing a discourse analysis, about how they talked about women and HIV AIDS in Africa. That was my project. So I'm going through it, I'm working on it. And what I notice is that when people are talking about women, they end up talking about microfinance a lot, to the point where, in one case, a senator says, how does your project address women's needs? And the answer is, we have a microfinance project. And I was like, wait. That doesn't say anything about women's needs, it just says microfinance. It was taken for granted. The discursive context assumed that if you want to reach women, the way to reach women is through microfinance. Well, I was then able to use my research analysis, right, to say this is a problem with how we're thinking about uh, HIV AIDS in Africa and women's issues, right? That we have a kind of very narrow focus on it. So that's what I was able to do with that. So. Like I said, discourse analysis and content analysis are different from each other, even though essentially what you're doing in both cases is reading texts. What's important is to figure out what do you want to learn? What's compatible with your approach to research? What's compatible with the questions you are answering? And so the question of whether you should do content analysis, whether you should do discourse analysis, or whether you want to say let a computer do some content analysis and then dig in deep on the stuff that's most interesting to you, for the discourse analysis, any of these are acceptable trajectories. It really depends on what you're looking to answer. I'm going to ask you a question that you're going to find a little ridiculous. What's a text? You're probably thinking at me right now, like you know what a text is. You've been literate for most of your life. A text is words arranged in a certain order. A text is something that somebody wrote. A text is Maybe right about now you're not so sure you know what a text is, right? So here's the deal. Lots of things can be texts. When we talk about textual analysis, we don't always mean reading books. We don't always mean going and reading newspaper articles. 
we often mean a much bigger context for what textual analysis is like. So let's think together about some things that are texts and that you can subject to textual analysis. So first thing is things that start as texts are texts. That sounds kind of ridiculous, but I think I'll explain. So when people write a diary of what happened, that's a text, right? When people write news reports or NGO reports on what happened, that's a text. When people make an argument that such and such is the way it works, that's a text. When people write a textbook, that's a text. All of these are things that you can go through and find and analyze as part of your process of figuring out what's in a text and you can analyze it, right? So anything that already exists as written is a text, right? Advertisements are a great source of text. Magazines are, all sorts of things. So, all right, things that start as texts are texts. The next thing is things that can be made into texts. Okay, so for instance, I'm speaking right now, but you also have access to a transcript that you can click on and use. Once you have that transcript, you can treat my statements as text, right? You could try to do it for me just talking, but it's often more efficient to work with these sorts of things as written versions. So for instance, a lot of textual analysis, one of the kind of areas that people work is they analyze the speeches of political figures, campaign speeches. Um, in the US, there's lots of analysis of presidential speeches um, or speeches made on the floor of parliament or other things like that. All of these are things that you can analyze as text. You can also take recorded interviews, right? Focus groups, um, anything like that where you're looking at what people have said and turning it into a text. Or you've got an, um, an oral story that someone tells can be used as a text. So essentially, if it's words, you can turn it into a text, right? I actually think song lyrics are a great place to look for kind of interesting ideas about politics and about society, right? So anything that can kind of be made into something you can hold on a piece of paper, or paste into a document, that's a text. But other things are texts too. So for instance, you can treat an image as a text. I just went and grabbed something that was close to me, which this is a book that I was just working through with a student. And if I were writing an analysis of this book, if I were trying to do a discourse analysis of this book, I would need to start with the cover, right? The cover has a carefully chosen image that was chosen in dialogue between the author and the publisher, right? And it uses the image of a tree. Hey, look, a tree, it's right in line with our class theme. Because of the way this tree is portrayed, right? The fact that it's as big above ground as below ground, the fact that the root system is it portrayed in such depth, um, the fact that um, the root system is revealed when it would normally be concealed. These are all things I can treat as text when looking at this book. You can also treat things about people as text. So this is a very simple example. These are my keys. You've probably seen them take me out of, out of the pocket and throw them on some surface at some point this semester. I have a moose on my keychain. See, nice little wooden moose. It's pretty cute. I got it at a, the shoe museum in Toronto. Why I got a moose at a shoe museum, I will never know. But what might you know about me from the fact that I carry a wooden moose in my pocket? Well, you might guess that I'm Canadian. You might guess that I like animals. You might think about why somebody would have something like this and what this image that somebody is associating with themselves might mean. Now, it's possible to go way, way, way too far down some kind of analytic path where you're like treating every little sign that exists in the universe as meaningful, and not all of them are. But sometimes it's useful, and sometimes if you think in a slightly writerly fashion about the details about people that matter, you'll want to do things like read their outfits, or read the posters that they put up or read the arrangement of space in a room. Now, this feels very, very confusing, but I wanna give you two examples that would allow you to think both in terms of content analysis and discourse analysis for using things other than written words as a text. So the first is content analysis. 
right? Um, when you're going to attend a protest to understand it, one of the first things you'll notice is the signs that people carry. So some of those are words. You can write down those words. Some of them, you need to look at the entire context of the sign in order to make it make sense. You need to figure out, what is this an image of? What do these words mean? Does this reference something else, right? And so, for instance, um, there was a really famous protest sign that I saw people using um, in climate change themed protests in the US where people would have a picture of the actor who played King George in Hamilton with the words, oceans rise, empires fall, which is a line from one of his songs. And of course, oceans rise, empires fall is a statement that makes a certain amount of sense on its surface when you're talking about um, climate change, right? Because we are dealing with rising sea levels. But it's contrasted with this picture of King George. And it's worth saying that in US political language, King George is kind of portrayed as the ultimate failure, right? He's like the terrible, evil king we rebelled against. I don't yet fully understand how Canadians think of uh, King George, but I still have my American upbringing to contrast here, right? And so the idea, that, and then the character of King George, as he's portrayed in the play Hamilton, is that he's kind of silly and not to be taken seriously, right? He's fully removed from the revolutionary milieu of our heroes, and he's the comic relief. Right? So on the one hand, you have a statement, oceans rise, empires fall. On the other hand, you have the invocation of a figure from history, George III. And on the third hand, you have the character who has a particular role in a play. And you kind of need to pick out these different elements of the contents in order to read that sign. Right? So that's a more content analysis focused way of looking at a, uh, looking at a image. Right? But you can also situate it in a broader discourse. Right? You can spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of repeatedly invoked symbols mean for the culture of a place. And so I remember lots of times when I would walk into people's offices. Right? I spent a lot of time going into people's offices and interviewing them about the organizations they run. And what I'll notice is what's on the walls. And how does what's on the walls interact with what they tell me, right? So if I'm in a place where there's a lot of talk about, um, where there's a lot of talk about social justice issues, but I don't see that mirrored in how the place looks, then I'll recognize there might be a disconnect. Or if I go into a place where people are making a big deal about an issue, I'll look to see what signs of it are reflected around. And then I'll analyze those images, I'll analyze where they're put, and then I'll use that as part of a way of trying to understand what the organization is about. Um, so one of my most interesting places, though it's not actually my favorite because the menu's pretty bad, um, one of my favorite places to think about in Ramallah, where I'm doing a lot of my research right now, is a cafe called Stars and Bucks. Right? So the world play with Starbucks here is obvious. Multinational corporations don't open businesses in the occupied West Bank. They open them in Israeli settlements and they open them inside Israel. But in the occupied West Bank and in Gaza, you don't have access to these multinationals. So someone engages in a little bit of copyright theft and starts the Stars and Bucks. Well, it's got a logo that's green and round, right? And then it has a kind of prominent place in the city center. OK, so at a content analysis, OK, they're making reference to Starbucks, and they're saying something about, you know, gives you an idea about the place. But then when you go in and you read the context of it, right, you start reading the context of the fact that the menu is no different from any of the other cafes in town, um, that they don't actually serve Starbucks-inspired beverages, right? The entire context in which they operate is totally, reserved, is totally removed from what they're trying to invoke, right? So in the space between what the Stars and Bucks logo promises and what their menu and what their environment delivers is the space where you can really figure out something about how ideas and concepts are working in that space. So texts can be all sorts of things. They can be written words. 
They can be words that you write down or that you move from one format to another, or they can be things that you read in a way that you might read texts. All of these can be combined together into different sorts of textual approaches to research.